Unidentified vessel, retreat to a minimum distance or I shall be forced to open fire upon you. This is your final warning. Your ship conforms to a Class 4B vessel. This installation will render your vessel into scrap without a moment's hesitation. Comply or... or... Oh my, our plan was successful. A powered down, desolate ship, drifting closer and closer to an unknown but unmistakable structure hanging in deep space. A ring we all know too well, one we have been familiar with for decades. Installation 04, home to Guilty Spark, a being very unlike any other in the galaxy. Having once been human, the Monitor finds himself far more inquisitive than the average created creature. Guilty Spark had reached the state of being previously believed impossible to an AI of forerunner nature, but his unique circumstance had led him to grow bored. He performed a lot of experiments on his installation, having let the flood run rampant on a small section, only to severely quarantine it, trying to occupy any given second of time. He had, however, managed to break the monotony for a brief moment when a vessel entered his installation's reach. Very little is known of this vessel. What we do know is that 343 Guilty Spark waited for days, then weeks, and months. Months turned to years, and those became millennia. The Monitor waited for anyone to exit the vessel, all the meanwhile constructing a sarcophagus to quarantine off said vessel of survivors. But in the end, it was meaningless as no one entered nor exited the vehicle, and it became forgotten to the ages. On that day, Guilty Spark vowed to not let that happen again. He would make contact with the next sapient life forms he encountered. He would know one way or another if his makers had succeeded or failed in their task against the Flood. This would be the day he had been waiting for, for eons. 343 Guilty Spark had followed every protocol dictated by the Forerunners. He had jammed transmissions from the unknown vessel and had given them a stern warning, but the vessel showed no signs of having any crew or power, ultimately leading to a repetition of the vessel of Eon's past. 343 Guilty Spark was excited to make first contact with a species after the firing of his installation. However, after thorough scanning, he came to realize two things. His first realization was, this vessel housed reclaimers. In a dormant state, he would have gladly woken them up, allowed them to reclaim the gifts of his makers, and end his exile. But his second realization was the true nail in the coffin. This vessel had detected positive for flood contact. His excitement withered on his mind. This flood had originated outside his installation, and signs pointed to an extensive battle between the flood and the now dormant crew, both on the exterior and the interior of the ship. Given these scans, his duty was clear. He had to quarantine the vessel, refute all contact from it, and seal it away, much like the first one. This would lead the Monitor into yet another state of being, not one his makers believed possible for an artificial creation, depression. Sparks soon thereafter began constructing the sarcophagus for the second vessel that would encompass the Spirit of Fire, all while slowly descending into madness. A state of rampancy which would dictate his actions be far more fierce upon his next encounter with biologicals. Extreme measures had to be taken next time. The events of Halo Combat Evolve start out exactly the same. After landing on the ring, however, Chief has begun receiving strange transmissions of an old UNSC frequency. While he is rescuing survivors from the crash of the Pillar of Autumn, he keeps receiving these signals, but unable to figure them out, things continue same as regular. Events stay the same until the truth and reconciliation. Master Chief and the group of marines that storms the Covenant capital ship are met with a surprise. In the skybox above, all the Covenant vessels begin to open fire. The UNSC forces on the ground think this is friendly fire. Maybe this ring is causing them to go crazy. Who knows? They certainly don't have time to sit and watch, no matter how lovely the sight of exploding Covenant ships may be. As Chief heads on board the Truth and Reconciliation, we see purple lights and explosions reflecting off his visor. Somehow I don't think that's good news for us. After rescuing Keys and him telling them about how the elites kept muttering about whoever controls Halo controls the galaxy, they flee on the stolen spirit. But to their surprise, there's hundreds of pieces of Covenant ships floating out in the orbit of the ring. Keys and the rest of the UNSC are confused as to what happened, and kind of chalk it up to friendly fire, but believe some of the Covenant wanted to take the ring for themselves and not the rest of their religion. This leads to the next mission, the Silent Cartographer. This goes by pretty quickly, as storming the beach isn't quite as difficult this time around. There is a lot less Covenant, but what Covenant forces are here are more desperate and ruthless. Chief has to face off against a lot more Jackal and Grunt reinforcements. 
instead of elites. The hunters also don't try to fight Chief outside. Instead, they wait inside to ambush him. Things seem very disorganized for the Covenant. Here, we once again get more transmissions of the secret old UNSC frequency. And Cortana begins to suspect there's other forces on the ring. Ones that are unaccounted for. The transmissions stop once Chief goes underground to storm the control room, however. The mission goes by almost exactly the same. The Chief notices something very different from the elites and other races of the Covenant. While he had snuck up on several enemies worshipping the ring as a holy relic, these ones seem to be mad and fueled by an unshakable anger. They don't care about damaging the ring anymore and are using crude tactics to root out the UNSC with kamikaze banshees and deploying 10 times the amount of wraiths as originally. Whatever damage the ring might take no longer concerns them. Throughout his journey on the ring, Cortana has been clearing up the signals, which she begins to understand. In this time, the same discovery happens with Silva insisting that they beat the Covenant to the weapons cache, which we know to be the Flood. The main difference here is that now Cortana has cleared up these mystery signals and she is sure they're of UNSC origin, with the only words she could clear up being Spirit of Fire. With this mention, Johnson perks up quickly. Spirit of Fire? They're alive? Here? Mind filling me in? The Spirit of Fire went missing 20-some years ago. After leaving Harvest in pursuit of a Covenant vessel, she vanished and went missing with all hands presumed lost in action. These transmissions aren't clear quite yet, but it seems either an escape pod or a communications buoy survived and made it here somehow. Could the whole ship have made it? Unlikely, or these transmissions would be a lot stronger. Keyes decided he wants to have them split up. Johnson knowing the crew of the Spirit of Fire. If there's even any of them alive, he would recognize or know them. Silva will swallow his pride and be forced to go with Johnson while Keyes goes to the site with the Flood. In the meantime, Chief reaches the control room. Once there, Cortana learns that it's the entire ship of the Spirit of Fire. Would you look at that? I was wrong. There's a first for everything. Don't start getting used to it. Hold on a minute. No. No, this can't be. Chief, you have to stop Keyes. No, that can't be. Oh, those Covenant fools. They must have known. There must have been signs. Slow down. You're losing me. The Covenant found something. Buried in this ring. Something horrible. And now, they're afraid. Something buried? Where? The Captain. We've got to stop the Captain. Keys? What the weapons we... cache he's looking for. It's not really... We can't let him get inside. I don't understand. There's no time. Get out of here. Find Keys. Stop him. Before it's too late! A reclaimer. One wearing sufficient gear to stave off infestation. I was beginning to think you reclaimers had a death wish. Identify. Who are you? I am the monitor of Installation 04. I am 343 Guilty Spark. Step out of the way, Spark. I have to get in there. I'm afraid that won't be possible. The Flood have taken this facility and are rapidly expanding their influence throughout the installation. The Flood? Surely you just reclaimer. Move out of the way. I have to get to Captain Keys. I won't ask again. Ah, yes, the leader amongst you. Yes, the Flood have already taken him and infected his vulnerable, vulnerable flesh. It is a shame. I had imagined I would have a chance to parley with him, but his foolishness got him killed. Did you kill Captain Keys? Guilty Spark teleports Master Chief to the library, where the mission transpires much the same as regular combat evolved, with one main difference being that Spark is a lot more talkative. He isn't passing out his only chance in a hundred thousand years to talk to anyone. What is the Flood? You really do not know? Oh my. The Flood are a parasitic organic life form that consumes biomass, predominantly sentient life forms, and incorporates both their knowledge and intellect into its hive mind. They were my maker's greatest foes. Your makers, the Forerunners? Precisely. I have been safeguarding this installation for millennia, waiting for you, Reclaimers. I never thought I would be the point of first contact. I had always assumed you would come more prepared. It was a foolish thought. Spark seems a little more energetic, but also erratic over the main timeline, as having had his hopes shattered when he had to quarantine the Spirit of Fire made him go a little more crazy than before. A little more rampant, if you will. Spark explains to Chief he was the reason the Covenant ships in orbit were destroyed, or at least a good chunk of them. He had attempted to make contact with both the Pillar of Autumn and the Covenant vessels when they arrived, but he was not successful. However, once he confirmed one of the factions to be the Reclaimers, he utilized almost every Sentinel at his disposal to attack the Covenant. The real reason was because he was scared. If the Reclaimers were killed, he would not have anyone to talk to again for thousands of years more. 
But what he tells Chief is that he was programmed to help the Reclaimers, as long as it didn't interfere with his taking care of Halo. Guilty Spark is frantically trying to get the Index, but not without taking his sweet time in order to circumvent the rules and have some company for once. Meanwhile, Johnson has arrived at the sarcophagus entombing the sleeping crew of the Spirit of Fire. This mission logistically would be against Sentinels. Halo would become a puzzle game momentarily as Johnson has to find clues and uncover how to get to the Spirit of Fire within the sarcophagus. Halfway through the mission would be him, Silva, and a few Marines and ODSCs starting to hear screeches in the distance. Rumblings of mayhem coming their way. But before they can be attacked by anything, they finally gain access to the Spirit of Fire. This would be followed by Johnson waking up the crew. Johnson walks past an empty cryopod. He sees the frost built up on it and the name. A name he recognizes. One he trained and fought alongside with on Harvest during their initial campaign against the insurrection and the early years of the Covenant War. He places a hand on the cryopod, looks down, he takes off his cap and shakes his head. This war has taken too many heroes. After a moment of silence, Johnson runs his hand over his bald head and strokes his wrinkling face. He sees his own reflection on the pod, puts on his cap and walks away. As he's walking away, he sees the crew beside him all getting out of their pods and trying their best to get on their feet and be ready. Once he gets to the commanding pod, he stands at attention and salutes. At ease, soldier. Is that you, Avery? Aye, sir. It's been a while. I'd say. Looking at you, I'd say we've been gone 30, 40 years. Do I look that bad? Ha! It's currently 2552. Good lord. We slept for 21 years. I'm gonna need a coffee and a status report if you don't mind. There's a lot to catch you up on, sir. And there's a few things you are just not going to believe. I could say the same thing to you, son. Cutter calling Johnson's son feels a little strange, as the man in front of him seems to be older than himself at this point. Cutter and Johnson discuss the major events of the last two decades, with Johnson finishing up by recounting the fall of Reach from his perspective. Cutter almost tears up. Reach was his own world. The entire reason he was fighting for had been wiped away, burnt and turned to glass and ash. We made them pay a million bodies for each inch of soil. I don't doubt it, Sergeant. Silva, in the meantime, has been happy to see a different captain from Keys, but his joy fades soon after when he sees three Spartans walking in his direction. He can't help but note how elegant and quiet their stroll is, fast and swift while carrying themselves with an imposing aura around them. The three Spartans walk past him nodding and heading into the cryo bay with Cutter. Silva scowls and goes to the armory. Johnson had finished telling Cutter about Halo, how they found it and what had been happening thus far. Cutter does not seem surprised. Instead, the shoe drops when Johnson hears about their fight against the Covenant and Flood on the shield world they found. Johnson makes a mental note of how shaken Cutter is when recollecting the Flood. This new foe sounded worse than the Covenant, something Johnson didn't think possible until now. After a lengthy catch up, and Johnson greeting Red Team back into the UNSC. He says, Spartans never die. They just go missing in action for 20 years. He tells Red Team Chief is on the ring, finding a way to control the ring and using it against the Covenant. All of Red Team goes cheery and excited. They believe in Master Chief more than anyone can imagine. He's the leader, friend, brother, and best of them in every regard in their minds. Red Team had been a group of washouts, but Halsey had rehabilitated them and they had successfully survived the transition into Spartans eventually. Them hearing John has been kicking ass on their behalf puts a smile on their face. Silva is extremely upset with seeing Johnson being buddy-buddy with the Spartans and decides to head outside of the Spirit of Fire. He believes his way out was safe since they had cleared everything on their way in. He leans against the hull of the ship and lights up a cigarette, but he sees a bush rustle in the distance followed by a shadow hastily move past the tree line. While training his weapon directly in the direction, he hears a thump behind him. He quickly turns around and looks up to see a creature crawling alongside the hull of the Spirit of Fire. It looks straight down the barrel of Silva's gun and jumps at him, shoving a hand inside Silva's mouth as it expands inside his esophagus. Silva manages to just barely kill the creature by unloading his entire clip into it. Being pinned under the weight and having the creature halfway down its lungs, Silva tries to push it off himself. But when he finally manages to push the creature off and starts to stand up only to see a similar but at the same time very different creature running at him full speed. We got back to Johnson as Cutter is receiving the report that more Flood are on board and infecting the crew. Cutter looks at Jerome, Spartan 092, and tells him, You know what to do, son. Jerome nods, looks over at Alice and Douglas. They nod back at him and take off sprinting. The Spartans are so fast it takes Cutter and Johnson a moment to register they aren't even there anymore. 
I better go help those boys out. No free lunches for this Marine. After running through hallways of people panicking and running in the opposite direction, Red Team turns a corner to hear screaming and wails of panic. The hallway is underlit and only sparks randomly illuminate the corridor. A shot is fired within the darkness. And with a flash of light, Red Team has managed to see, even if only for a microsecond, their targets. They begin to shoot and hold down the corridor as dozens of infected flood lifeforms run at them tripping over one another, mutating into a horror mess every step of the way down to the Spartans. Alice begins to clear a path forward slowly with her shotgun as Jerome pushes behind her, spraying the crawling messes with SMG ammo. Douglas drops to one knee. Now kneeling, he sets his pistol on his knee and starts taking slow but deliberate shots into the darkness ahead, each shot going through what would be the brain on a regular person. Once Alice has pushed through the entirety of the hallway leading to the rest of the ship, she gives out an all-clear signal, only to hear Enders in their comms say she's still reading a significant infected life form. The Spartans look around and don't see any flood moving except for one tiny infection form trying to hide under the corpses of the now deceased flood form. Alice is inspecting bodies on one side of the hallway while Douglas is on the other, with Jerome right down the middle squatting down to reach for the infected form. Right as Jerome gets closer to the floor, a Spartan laser blasts at full strength above him, blasting an infected elite rushing him. Jerome looks up quickly to see Johnson putting a cigar in his mouth. I already have one Spartan I babysit. Don't make it four. Jerome thanks Johnson, and Red Team pushes forward to find and destroy any stragglers. Chief gets teleported to the control room, the moment he reaches over for the index. Essentially, this part is the same. However, Chief's escape from the control room and the subsequent mission changed by having Cortana expose that the UNSC went into the sarcophagus, but still hasn't come out. They managed to blow their way in, but the sentinels quickly hurried inside to stop anything from getting out and sealed it back up. These are constructor sentinels, not combat ones. Spark had used all of those. We find out Spark had betrayed them by almost having them activate Halo, which he really didn't want to lose his companionship again, but he knew the plan had worked once and was convinced that if the Halos fired again, the plan would work once more, and all he would have to do is build up an arsenal of sentinels and wait for the reclaimers to arrive again. Spark truly believed he could protect and guide the reclaimers better with a second try. Cortana intends to have the Master Chief go get the crew so they can launch a full strength assault between Johnson and his marines into truth and reconciliation to find the remains of Keys as the plan is almost the exact same as the original timeline. Chief has Fohammer pick him up and heads into the entombed Spirit of Fire. When we get back to the Spirit of Fire, we see that Anders has been analyzing the structure of the sarcophagus around the ship. She devises a plan, very similar to the one they employed during the Halo Wars campaign, where they used gremlins to keep the Forerunner pylons shut down. This time, they will shut down the Sentinel Fabricators that keep protecting and rebuilding the sarcophagus. The mission is for Johnson and the Spartans as well as the crew of the Spirit of Fire to work together on taking out all four locations, keeping the Spirit of Fire trapped. The first half of the mission would be from a Halo Wars style ga gameplay. Story-wise, Johnson gets to his fabricator first, driving a gremlin. Once the Spartans get to the other three to take them out, Johnson is overwhelmed by Flood and Sentinels. He has to abandon the gremlin, which means they can't get out yet. But this abandoning means that Red Team has to come together to destroy the final location. This switches over to the regular Halo mission. As you play from Jerome's point of view, it would feel very similar to Halo Reach as Douglas and Alice assist Jerome in defeating the undead hordes of Flood and mechanical warrior sentinels about. Though they defeat all enemies in the area, they think the plan is busted because they can't take down all four locations. That's when Johnson arrives in a mechanized suit, each step making the ground shake. Johnson on board a Cyclops, an experimental one at that, one called a Colossus, twice the size of a regular Cyclops. He immediately goes to town on tearing down the, the Forerunner Fabricator and the force field that's keeping the Spirit of Fire entrapped inside the sarcophagus. By the time Chief manages to arrive to help the crew, he sees from the Pelican cockpit the sarcophagus crumble and the Spirit of Fire rise into the sky triumphantly, rising over the horizon. Instead of coming to help, Chief and Forheimer dock inside the Spirit of Fire and acquaint themselves with the crew. This gives Master Chief a chance to catch up with Red Team. Red Team's biggest concern isn't who's winning the war or what kind of new weapons and technology have been advanced in the last two decades. No. Their only questions are regarding what Spartans are still active, how many colonies they've lost, and if Mendes and Halsey are still alive. While Chief and Red Team catch up, 
Cutter has now assumed command. As Cortana is plugged into the Spirit of Fire, she analyzes all the data left behind by Serena. Cortana is seemingly sad, mentioning what a tragic life Serena had. With less than a year of being active and spending the remainder of her life in a ship with nothing to do or anything to occupy her mind, Cutter is also sad. From his perspective, it had only been yesterday when he saw Serena, an AI he considered a child. The relationship he had formed with his ship and its AI felt akin to family. Cortana has informed them of what happened to Keys. While she only knew he was infected from 343 statements to the chief, she could still track the neural implants within him. Cortana is semi-aware of what the flood are from being inside the control room's console, but she does not have the first-hand experience the Spirit of Fire crew does. She insists they may be able to cure Keats, but Cutter tells her he only wishes that were true. He lost a lot of crew on the other Forerunner Shield world to those things, and Anders' research had proved that if a cure existed, it was far beyond them, especially if the Forerunners themselves couldn't find a cure. Besides sterilizing the whole galaxy, Cortana and Cutter make a plan. Red Team will go to the truth and reconciliation and forcibly remove Keith's implants in order to blow up the Pillar of Autumn and stop both the Flood from leaving Halo and the Covenant from getting the power of the ring. While they do that, the Spirit of Fire will go to the Pillar of Autumn and deploy a base over it, where they can set up a limited campaign against the amassing forces. Their main goal is to secure the area from the Flood and Covenant, as well as remove the Shafujikawa slip space drive from the Autumn so they can transport it to the Spirit and use it themselves. That way, once the red team comes back, they can quickly overload the reactor and get out of there. If I haven't made it clear yet, the Flood here are a bit stronger and smarter than in the original timeline. When 343 Guilty Spark sent out the Sentinels to attack the Covenant, they brought down a lot of ships. The survivors and those who escaped, the mayhem landed on the ring, meaning a lot of biomass was ripe for the Pyrocyte to consume. Fohammer drops Red Team and Chief on top of Truth and Reconciliation. Watch your backs out there. The Flood is nothing like any foe we've faced before. No offense, Chief, but I think we have more experience than you do against these things. Chief has now been assigned as Red 1. Jerome, Red 2, Alice, Red 3, and Douglas as Red 4. Chief just automatically becomes the leader of any Spartan team he's in, with good reason. After their brief discussion and Chief informing them on the layout of the Truth and Reconciliation, the Pelican Bay doors open only to see complete chaos around. Every Covenant ship left uninfected is trying to stay that way, and the Flood is quite readily pushing the Covenant to its extremes. Here's where we note that Fohammer is crazy, downright insane, and the best pilot in the UNSC. Though there are shots being fired in every direction, she manages to fly high above the truth and reconciliations, and the Spartans all jump out of the Pelican in a 45 degree angle. She flies away with a smile on her face, dodging plasma bolts left and right. They aren't aiming to land on top, but instead, they're aiming to get straight down into the gravity lift. The sudden change in gravity will hurt and be disorienting, but it beats having to go through all the flood and covenant on the ground. That being said, they land exactly as intended, in the middle of the gravity lift stream, getting immediately pulled into the ship. Chief lands inside first, raising his assault rifle in attention. The rest of Red Team follows right after. They have barely touched down when six hunters run through the hallway ahead of them, clearly charging at something. Red Team easily guesses this must be the flood. They immediately start heading the other way to get Key's location, but as soon as they start taking the hallways, they see infected life forms all around, as well as some in the middle of being infected. Red Team proceeds on to clear the hallway, while shooting the Flood first and Covenant only if it seems necessary. They know killing the Elites and Jackals and such won't matter if the Flood just repurposes their bodies. Chief clearly leads the charge through the ship, with Alice watching their back and Jerome and Douglas tagging Chief's left and right only a few feet behind. The Covenant are split in this decision. Some are choosing to ignore the Spartans, others are choosing to help keep the Flood off them, but the Spartans don't understand why. A grunt ahead of them makes up his mind on whether they are friend or foe, and activates plasma grenades on his hands, then decides to charge the Spartans, when suddenly an infection form lands on his face digging deep into the grunt's skull and burying itself inside the grunt. The grunt runs past the Spartans while the infector was distracting him. The short distraction serves to have several combat forms with elongated and deep form arms run at the Spartans. Chief dodges a strike from an infected elite, and Douglas immediately follows up with a full clip to the creature. Jerome counters another creature's swing by using its momentum against it and shoving it into the wall. Pushing with the weight of his armor, the flood form is trapped between the Spartan and a hard place. The flesh of the creature doesn't last long as it's getting squished like a toothpaste bottle with no cap. 
Chief strikes another with the end of his assault rifle, shoving the creature back to be met with six pellets coming from Alice's shotgun. Chief guns down a few more of the creatures coming at him, while Douglas runs up on one, jumps into the air high enough to have his knee make a direct contact with the human flood form, right where its face would have been, and landing directly on top of it to keep shooting the revolting mass. Jerome tosses a grenade down the hall, but it hits something they hadn't seen coming down, a carrier infection form. The grenade causes it to blow it up and explode, launching small infection forms at the Spartans, and the Covenant further behind them trying to crawl away from the fight. Chief catches one with his hand and crushes it, making a popping sound louder than he expected. He looks over to his left and sees Jerome kicking another one of the infectors across the hallway, right back the direction it came from. Chief is mostly surprised to see the creature didn't turn into mush from the force of a Spartan kicking it, but continues to fire his gun, tearing a combat form's arm clean off. He hears Alice's gun blasting off as quickly as it can, which helps him realize they are being sandwiched. Red 4, assist 3, 2 with me, push through double time. The moment Chief gives orders, the entire team shifts. Jerome and Chief stand shoulder to shoulder in the middle of the hallway, firing down their sights at anything that moves towards them, while Alice and Douglas keep a steady backward space putting down the foes ambushing them, completely keeping their focus on the rear, knowing Chief and Jerome will not let anything pass them and onto Red 3 and 4. While walking down the corridor, Chief notices the tag for keys is right on the other side of the wall. He knows how to get there, but instead decides to save that time and makes a hand gesture to Jerome, tapping his own chest with a closed fist. Jerome knows exactly what Chief meant, and looks over to the left to pick up a dead grunt's body. He rips off the mask of the grunt, only to realize the grunt wasn't dead quite yet. But now with the force of the Spartan twisting his body around like a ragdoll, the grunt is finally put out of its misery. Jerome shakes the container, and it quickly becomes cold enough that it can feel a small temperature change within. His nerves threw me all near. He breaks apart the device and lathers up the wall, painting it with the methane. He takes the now truly dead grunt's plasma grenade and tosses them against the wall. The chief and him quickly run over to cover Douglas and Alice with their own bodies, and the wall explodes in a massive flame. Chief and Jerome push through, with Alice and Douglas keeping the hole in the wall to keep their backs, one facing down each side of the hallway, massacring down anything running their way. Inside, Chief and Jerome are met by strange flood forms. Some Chief had not seen until now, but ones vaguely resembling the ones Jerome had fought on the Forerunner Shield world. A few pure flood forms have begun to spawn through mutation, but what's more concerning is the hulking mass in the middle of the room. This thing is in a transitional period. It's no longer the thing resembling a proto grave mine from the original timeline, but it is also not a grave mine, not quite yet. Slightly shocked at whatever the pus filled creature in front of them might be, Chief and Jerome pushed just deep enough into the room to retrieve neural implants from within what used to be Captain Key's head. Jerome protects Chief from incoming creatures while he does that. Seeing this as his only chance to get some payback for what they did to Keys, Master Chief leaves a grenade inside the husk of Key's body, and the two Spartans take off running into the hallway with Douglas and Alice. They plan to exit out the vehicle bay. Red 3, take the lead. Chief and Alice run through, eliminating everything that moves, making their way past where they came in. But down the hallway, the hunters had gone. They are all surprised to see the six hunters' carcasses, but not so much their bodies, but the armor the worms usually pilot. Their surprise is more them not seeing the worms around. They all know this means the flood consumed them in one way or another. Chief starts to contact Full Hammer to get her to come pick them up in the vehicle bay, because that's their best chance to get out. However, on the way there, they still face through a few more flood farms. But these are almost all made up of pure flood. Red Team still manages to clear out the opposition, but notice it is definitely becoming a tougher fight in terms of predicting the flood's moves. When they finally make it to the vehicle bay, Foe Hammer is not there as the fighting outside had gotten somehow even worse. Foe Hammer admits even she can't pilot into that mess, and Chief responds, Then we'll have to make our way out on our own. The rest of Red Team follows his lead when he climbs into a banshee. They all do the same and the four Spartans blast off, speaking out of the truth and reconciliation. While all of this occurred, the Spirit of Fire had been deploying a full military base on top and around the Pillar of Autumn, with Johnson on the ground leading the charge with his Colossus. This part once again would be an RTS like Halo Wars, 
with the goal being to establish a zone to land the base and make two paths, one to the slip space drive and one to the engine core. Cutter focuses his forces between clearing a path to the slip space drive over the engine room, since he could use the slip space engine as a makeshift bomb just like they did back on the Forerunner shield world. He understands one way or another they can't let the flood get their hands on it. Johnson's role here is to use the Colossus to carry and move the slip space drive and transport it back to the Spirit of Fire. As Johnson is finishing taking the slip space drive out of the Autumn, Full Hammer arrives being escorted by Red Team's Banshees. Red Team arrives just in time to rain down plasma on the Flood trying to stop Johnson. Full Hammer couldn't transport the Spartans, but instead this time around, Red Team drops the Banshees on top of the Autumn and they help load up the slip space drive into the Pelican. Chief assigns Jerome and Douglas to go with Johnson and load it up on the Spirit of Fire, double time. Chief and Alice head into the Pillar of Autumn and fight their way through the remaining spec up elites and Flood all over the ship. The mission happens almost exactly the same except with two Spartans things go far more smoothly. Yes, the Flood are stronger here, but Alice is seasoned against the Flood, and the Flood aren't actually focusing too much on the Pillar of Autumn. Their main goal is to build a grave mine and take one of the Covenant ships off Halo. But what's happening in the ground is that Thalvatomy is striking down any ship leaving the orbit of the ring. Chief and Alice have a warthog run to the site where Fohammer is usually supposed to pick up the Chief and instead that's where the Banshees were set down. Alice and Chief escape the Pillar of Autumn and take their Banshees up to the Spirit where Johnson, Jerome and Douglas have been hauling ass to load up and properly mount the slip space drive. Cortana has plugged in a course for the Spirit of Fire to stop at Reach. They plan to pick up the Spartans because Chief and her know there is no way the Spartans would have died. This basically leads to the events of First Strike except with an extra 3 Spartans. Meaning the battle doesn't cost the lives of Lee and Anton. With the extra Spartan power, when the Spirit of Fire comes across the UNSC Gettysburg and the Ascendant Justice, the elites that hide and manage to get a shot off on Anton and Lee this time do not survive. With two extra Spartans and Red Team, the invasion for Earth is gonna go quite a bit different. On board High Charity, an elite stands before a crowd of San Shayum, elites and brutes, with a much larger crowd gathering outside, composed of drones, grunts, jackals, and worms seeping through the underbowels of the stage. Thalvatomy stands there, plasma scars covering his body, still worn out from the battle and installation of war. He can barely stand or stay awake, yet he must stand there before judgment, receiving a public flogging and hatred from all the races around. The council makes a public showing of viscerally assaulting Thalvatomy, but inside he knows with the parasite unleashed there, there was nothing he could do especially after their own gods had rejected them. His fleet was attacked by the oracle and the gifts the prophets had promised had been robbed from between his fingers. Thel seeps into his own rage inside, but knows better than to voice it here in front of this crowd. After being taken away for his judgment and to his punishment, he is propositioned with becoming the Arbiter, at which he accepts the position of Arbiter, but not after semi-arguing with the prophets, telling them the parasite had to take priority over everything else including the humans. The prophets say this is heresy, except for truth. He floats over to see their new arbiter and tells him they know the parasite was a challenge for their gods. They could not have expected him and his fleet to defeat them. So he must right this wrong by going to the station where he usually kills the heretic and his forces. But in this timeline, the flood escaped the ring and managed to take the platform where the heretic was hiding. At this point, however, most of his forces have succumbed to the flood and he is desperately trying to hide inside the shield he originally strapped himself inside of. The only reason the Flood have completely overwhelmed the Heretic this time around is because they had a little extra biomass and strength before the ring blew up. To this end, the Prophets task their Arbiter with slaying the Heretic and vanquishing the Flood. Thalvatomy heads down just like in the original timeline, except more prepared for Flood than originally. Only the best of the best go down with the Arbiter. By the time the Arbiter reaches the Heretic, however, the shield has been taken down and he doesn't find his body. Instead, he gets a signal from his equipment, burrowed deep into a grotesque mask of cancerous flesh. As the Arbiter reaches into it, he sees it move and shiver. Inside his head, the Arbiter hears, This does not belong to you. Shook and stunned, the Arbiter leaps back and prepares his sword. And just so, as a bunch of tentacles try to reach out at him, the Arbiter and his forces all focus fire on the massive creature, all while they're being surrounded by its mass and flesh. After a dozen plasma grenades, several deaths from his team, the Arbiter does manage to defeat the Gravemind with a relentless flurry of sword slashes 
burning the flesh to a cinch. By the time the brutes come to pick them up, the elites that survived are tired and all trying to just get back to high charity. While Tartarus is trying to sniff around looking for the monitor as they had gotten a report of it being the, with the heretic, but 343 Guilty Spark is no longer there. The burning flesh and scent of flood covers up one thing though. A pack of flood infection forms hop out onto the underneath of the phantom and cluster up. They shrivel up and go into a hibernation state to avoid detection. Unknown to the brutes or elites, they have taken Flood with them to high charity. This doesn't initially become evident as they're still hibernating and no one has bothered to check the phantom. However, after his mission to defeat the Flood and kill the heretic, something still does not sit right with the Arbiter. The Oracle of the Gods chose to attack them in order to protect the humans. The reclamation had kicked into gear with the beginning of the Human Covenant War, and those two events seemed to point to a contradiction he could not overlook. The Arbiter plans on investigating every log from the fight personally, both the discovery of humanity and the subsequent first contact, as well as the battle above the Holy Relic, Halo. Meanwhile on Earth, Red Team and Cutter are receiving a hero's welcome after being presumed dead for decades. Attending the ceremony is Ryan Forge, Sergeant Forge's daughter. She has arrived with her ship, the Ace of Spades. After having vowed to find the truth she thought the UNSC had kept from her, she feels lost and without purpose, but is content in knowing what her father truly died for. Her crew is not happy to be dealing with the UNSC, but since they are like family to her, they are only here to help her get closure. She relinquishes control of her ship and makes a formal request to join the UNSC. A complete 180 degree turn from what her whole life has been about for the past two decades. But she believes if her father gave his life for Cutter, his crew, his ship, and his cause, then it must be a worthy cause. Cutter and Admiral Hood personally assure her that once she goes through basic training, she will have a spot on Cutter's ship. Lastly, Johnson comes up to her. He hands her a picture he had from 30 years earlier. With John Forge and a bunch of other Marines, Johnson had trained on Harvest. Your father was one of the greatest soldiers I've ever known. Hell, he was one of the best men I've ever known. Those are some mighty big boots to fill, but I'm sure they'll fit you quite nicely. My father talked a lot about you. It seems you were his role model. While surrounded by captains, lieutenants, and admirals, he thought of you as the most important man in the room. I hope to serve alongside you someday, sir. Me too, kid, me too. Cutter and Admiral Hood are going over all of the things that the Spirit of Fire saw in the Forerunner Shield World and Halo. In the meantime, the Spirit of Fire is receiving a few upgrades and repairs, as much as they can afford to anyways. This is when they get the signal that the Covenant has arrived in Seoul. Cortana alerts them just as the original and they all go to their stations to fight the Covenant. With the Spirit of Fire being here near Kyra Station, the little bit of extra firepower goes a long way. As well as three Spartans in the form of Red Team, they can defend more of the orbital platforms and stop them from being blown up. After Red Team sees Master Chief return the bomb back to the Covenant, they do the same, managing to take out a lot of Covenant ships with them. The Covenant having less ships and five more Spartans in total to contend against means that when Master Chief goes down to Earth to New Mombasa and gets taken on the In Amber Clad in pursuit of Regret's ship and ends up traveling to Installation 05, Red Team stays behind defending Earth in other vital places. Most notably with Anton and Lee surviving the escape from Reach, Red Team is sent to Antarctica instead of Blue Team. Instead, Blue Team comprised of Fred, Kelly, Linda, Lee, Anton, and Will go to the Yucatan Peninsula and then go on to Havana, Cuba, where they defend the space elevator. This is essentially following right along with the events of First Strike and Ghost to Onyx. However, with the extra Spartans alive, when Halsey calls for reinforcements to Onyx, Lord Hood sends all of these Spartans. I know you all want me to get back to Halo 2 already, but bear with me for a moment. We're gonna take quite a large detour for the events of Onyx. See, having two extra Spartan 2s radically changes the events on planet Onyx. But before that, since Blue Team was sent to Onyx, Red Team stayed to defend Earth. That's three more Spartans than the original timeline, with an already decreased Covenant presence after they used their own bombs against them, meaning the battle against the Covenant is far easier. This gives the UNSC more time and resources to find out what the Covenant were looking for underneath New Mombasa. Red Team rescues and escorts Buck's ODSC squad out of New Mombasa. The UNSC learns of the Ark and the portal and immediately begin to work on a way to get to the Ark. On Onyx, the arrival of the same Spartans plus Anton and Lee shifts the tides a bit more to the UNSC sides. Here, 
I will make another change to the timeline. I hope you forgive me, as I usually only try to make one change and let things play out from there. But this has always bothered me. On Planet Onyx, Kurt puts on SPI armor instead of Mjolnir, claiming he's one of them when talking to the Spartan 3s. But I believe here the change I would make is him using the superior Mjolnir armor, as that would give him not just the best chance of survival, but logically it would give his whole squad a better chance to survive. I understand this is a transitionary moment in his character's arc, but logically speaking, he could have saved that I'm one of you moment for another time that wouldn't cost them their lives. I know criticizing Kurt is almost a mortal sin in the Halo community, but yep, there you have it. Kurt wears Mjolnir during the fight for Onyx. This plus the two other Spartan 2s means Kurt is not injured. Along with having Lee and Anton here, this means Will does not die either. Spartan 043 Will originally dies when confronting a pair of hunters on hand-to-hand -hand combat, but this time he doesn't have to. When Kelly is hit by the concussive round that leaves her dazed and vulnerable, Will goes to jump into the fight. But instead, seeing as he did not have a weapon at the time, Anton and Lee rush a hunter each instead. Anton runs up to the hunter on the left, jumps on top of the hunter's shield and sprays a full clip of his SMG into the exposed worms with his right hand while using his left hand to hold the hunter's left arm from shooting the cannon. Lee, on the other hand, makes the second hunter attack him, but moves out of the way, swerving a strike and using the microseconds of available time to pump a shotgun shell into its exposed midriff. The hunter, now grievously injured by losing a large amount of worms, swings wildly, but Lee manages to stay behind it, placing a frag grenade inside where the missing worms would be. Both Spartans leap out of the way and take cover as the grenade blows up inside the hunter on the right and shrapnel blows into the one on the left, putting both of them down for the count. This essentially saves Will from a needless death, now with three Spartans more alive by the time they reach the Shield World's portal. This allows them to hold off the Covenant a bit more time. Yes, it is a few more Spartans against the entire Covenant Armada, but it still means they manage to hold off just a bit longer. That means that when Kurt orders them to retreat into the portal, they have managed to stall long enough for the AI in charge of Planet Onyx's UNSC defenses in the summer has managed to set a timed explosion of the warheads Kurt originally sacrifices himself with, meaning yet another Spartan survives. The events in space are not affected by all these Spartans, however, and the UNSC does a valiant effort in teaching the Covenant humility, but in the end, it all winds up the same. The only UNSC ship to survive is the UNSC Dusk. More importantly, once planet Onyx breaks up into trillions of sentinels that utterly wipe out the Covenant, the Dusk doesn't just take off back to Earth. See, inside the portal that takes the Spartans, Halsey and Mendes, is a slip space bubble holding the shield world Dyson sphere and in there time moves slower than in normal space. See this time with extra survivors and then being Spartans means they don't tire as quickly as regular people. They manage to explore part of the shield world way faster. They discover prone to drift aka the engineer Huragok and all this means they make contact with the UNSC Dusk before it returns to Earth. Seeing there's no threat left outside the slip space bubble, the engineer prone to drift brings the Dyson Sphere into real space months earlier than they do in the original timeline. And if you want to ask me how four Spartans just reduced four months of wandering around inside the slip space bubble, I'm going to chalk it up to two things. One, they can spread around more, covering a lot more ground. And two, the one who finds prone to drift wouldn't be Lucy, it would be someone who can actually speak. And even if the engineer can't speak back, it can clearly understand. That in itself is a lot of time not wasted. All right, welcome back to those who skipped the Onyx section. Just know these events are gonna be a little bit more important heading on to the rest of the video. Back on installation 05, Master Chief and the in Ember clad have arrived. These events are almost exactly the same except with one difference. When High Charity exits slip space, it is on fire and almost immediately out behind it thousands of Covenant ships are fighting one another. It is a full-blown civil war within the Covenant from Chief's point of view. For those of you wondering, what? I have three words for you. In English, that means... Thel Vanamy, having done research, meditation, and evaluation of all available data, has come to a harrowingly shocking conclusion. One he feels revolted by and contemplates taking his own life for, even thinking about. 
the only thing that explained why the prophets were so hellbent on destroying humanity, yet the oracle itself tried to protect them, why forerunner technology never truly naturally reacted to them, but it just happened to be on every human world. This truth is something the Arbiter doesn't want to believe, but after seeking aid from the wisest elites he's ever known without directly telling them what weighs on his mind, he decides he must confront the prophets and the council to get the final verdict he seeks. During the time he spent doing his research, however, the location of a second halo ring had been found, and High Charity had begun its journey to the Holy Relic. While in slip space, High Charity rapidly began to approach the grave mind of Delta Halo, setting the stage for the infection forms on board the Phantom docked on High Charity to exit their dormant state. In one of the vehicle bays, several Kig Yar working on regular maintenance and repairs to a nearby Banshee hear the skittering of steps and look over to see a small misfigured shadow cross from a phantom to a nearby ghost. The jackals stop their work. One throws an insult, claiming it to be a dirty little rat. They believe it's a grunt and plan to attack him to teach him a lesson. The two jackals quickly run over both sides of the ghost, but find that they never stood a chance to begin with. One is immediately set upon by the infection form, strangling the jackal's neck and forcing itself inside him. The other jackal is shocked and trips over himself, falling backwards. As he begins to run away, he sees a brute coming in his direction. The jackal struggles to make any sounds besides some high-pitched squawks, but when he reaches the brute's to beg for help, the brute grabs him by the neck, lifts him up and slams him to a wraith. The jackal knows how brutal the brutes are, but he believes this attack to be unprovoked, until he sees several boils popping out from the brute's face. From on top of the wraith, leaps down an infection form seeping its tendrils into the jackal's ear canal. The last thing the jackal sees from the corner of his eye is the jackal he had been doing maintenance with. Hell, it could have been any jackal in the galaxy, but the only thing he recognized was the clothing. The jackal was enlarged and hobbling about. He had become a carrier, now able to reproduce at an exponentially faster pace. We cut back to the Arbiter having summoned the Council and the Prophets to the giant chamber. He has a few loyal supporters, but he knows this audience will either be his end or that of the Covenant. The Prophet of Mercy demands, What is the meaning of this? The Arbiter begins to explain his findings. He informs the entire council, but the prophets aren't having any of it, quickly demanding Tartarus and his brutes to silence the Arbiter for his heresy. Though a fight breaks out between the brutes and the Arbiter's supporters, the Arbiter continues to plead his case loudly in the chamber for anyone to hear. He gets booze and called a heretic, but some others listen and begin to put the pieces together themselves. So much so that the factions within the crowd start to fight, or so it seems to everyone around. In reality, the first strike wasn't between believer and heretic. It wasn't between brute and elite. It was between infected and not infected. The flood had reached the council chamber, but it had looked like a battle between the brutes and elites had broken out, and chaos and mayhem soon followed and began to seep into the entire arena, a mess the prophets could not contain. They demand Tartarus protect them so they can flee and escape until things get under control. This causes the collapse of the Covenant, a great schism from truth and lies, and the prophets abandoning the elites. And siding with the brutes becomes extremely clear what side they had chosen. On the surface of Delta Halo, Chief looks up waiting for pickup from Fohammer to regroup with Johnson and Miranda. They are facing the flood while trying to get to the Index. Chief doesn't get bombarded and tossed into the water this time, as all the ships aboard High Charity are having a massive civil war. Chief and Fohammer go pick up Johnson and Miranda at the library and flee back to the In Amber Clad. Without the Index or a human, they won't be able to fire the ring. In Amber Clad has to fend off against the Flood. But unlike Halo 2, where the Grave Mind commits its forces to taking on the In Amber Clad, it is absent here. It has its sights on a bigger price. From In Amber Clad, they see High Charity comes crashing down onto the surface of Delta Halo. With this, a hundred ships of the remaining Armada take off into slip space, and the others remain here fighting off stragglers, surrounding Delta Halo to stop anything from leaving. In Amber Clad is completely surrounded when they get a transmission from the Shadow of Intent. The Arbiter seeks to speak with them. We learned of what happened on High Charity and how once sides were chosen, the elites banded together against the Prophets and the Flood. The Flood began to spread throughout High Charity and with so many on board, it was a stronghold for the Flood. The elites chose to shoot down High Charity to stop the Flood, which cost them a lot of ships and gave the Prophets enough time to properly side with the Brutes and escape. 
the elites now knowing they aren't the reclaimers, but also not accepting that humans are, simply want to make a truce to stop the Flood and the Covenant. Miranda agrees with the Arbiter, as he informs them of the Prophets going to Earth, seeking the Ark. Since this ring has the Flood and the elites, Miranda agrees with the Arbiter, as he informs them the Prophets will be going to Earth for the Ark, since this ring has the Flood and elites. The elites will stay here with nearly all of their ships and make sure the Flood can't get off the world. Well, off the installation. While the Arbiter and a few ships head back to Earth with in Ember Clad to stop the Covenant. Especially now that Miranda has had Cortana show the elites the truth of what Halos do. And how they can wipe out all life on the galaxy. As in Ember Clad enters slipspace, they see hundreds of blown up ships in orbit of Halo. Back on Earth, the UNSC has been working on uncovering the portal to the Ark and succeeded. The first ship to go through was the Spirit of Fire, of course. By the time In Amber Clad arrives back on Earth, however, they learn Onyx is gone and instead a giant Dyson Sphere had appeared in its place. And the UNSC dust came back to Earth with Spartans. A lot of Spartans. By the time the In Amber Clad and the Elites arrived on Earth though, they see Africa is nearly entirely glassed as well as Southwest Asia. Hood informs Miranda, Johnson and Chief, when the Covenant arrived with a hundred ships they overwhelmed Earth quickly. The battle on the ground was a victory with so many Spartans, but that made the Covenant desperate and they began glassing parts of Earth just because they could. They wanted morale low, even if it didn't affect Spartans. Chief learns that the Spirit of Fire went to the Ark in order to set up a dozen bases around the megastructure to protect it for when the Covenant inevitably came looking for it. Hood says it's unfortunate that they did since they could have used the Spirit of Fire as the Covenant almost immediately after arrived on Earth. The Covenant found the portal to the Ark. Even though the UNSC tried to reinforce the area with everything from Spartans to Mac cannons, the Covenant that survived Earth's defenses just bombarded the hell out of the continent, glassing everything around and further excavating the portal. The first mission after returning from Delta Halo is to rescue Blue Team from the glassed underground remains of Africa. Chief and the Arbiter work together, just like Halo 3, in taking down Brutes and the Covenant teams on the ground trying to secure the area, since the Prophets were going to be crossing the portal soon. The Arbiter is surprised to see and find so many Spartans, so many demons. For decades, while he was Fleet Master, he hadn't known how many there was. But after an encounter against Spartan Jai 006, he had known firsthand how fearsome and deadly they were. Seeing eight Spartan twos in one place has his head spinning. This cleared up a lot of questions as how to the Covenant had not managed to beat humanity after nearly three decades of war. Chief had heard of Kurt's current status and isn't surprised to see him alive, but he is most welcome. Their reunion is cut short as a rumbling shakes the ground and they have to hurry to escape the falling debris. The elites and Spartans all work together to get out of the underground tunnels of New Mombasa, trying to make their way past hundreds of brute, grunt, jackal and drone corpses. By the time they reach the surface though, they see the portal is open and a dozen ships gathering around it. Before the remains of the UNSC fleet can engage them though, half pass through to the other side and the other six are stopped. The Arbiter exclaims they must hurry and meet the fake prophets on the other side and stop them from activating the rings. The scene plays out similarly to Halo 3's war table meeting between Hood, the Arbiter and Ratas Vadum, except with eight Spartans around and a lot more elites on their toes. None of them have addressed the big elephant in the room. They waged war against humanity based on lies, and they had been the Forerunner's actual chosen people. The humans don't have all this info either, but they can feel a lot of strange tension from the elites. This is a conversation Rataz is not ready to have, and as leader of this meeting, he sticks strictly to the topic of heading through the portal and stopping truth and mercy. Lord Hood is once more hesitant to send any forces through the portal, saying that other Covenant forces are still on the planet and more could show up at any moment. Chief convinces him of sending Blue Team in, but being very deceiving by not mentioning that he had already added all the Spartans in the room to Blue Team's roster. Johnson, being fully aware of what Chief did, just gives him a side glance and laughs while walking away. Cortana speaks directly into Chief's head. He is going to be mad when he realizes what you did. Hood this time around though, says he can't afford to send even a single ship to the other side, since they already had one that hadn't made contact since its departure. The Spirit of Fire went with clear instructions and orders, and Hood had trusted Cutter. Knowing his judgment, they would do whatever was necessary on the other side to safeguard Earth. Chief and Blue Team stay on Shadow of Intent while Miranda and Hood go back to Cairo. Johnson also managed to talk himself into staying on board, claiming, These boys are gonna need a babysitter to play nice. They were at each other's throats just hours ago. 
Captain's Report, December 11th, 2552. Five hours, five long hours. That's how long we held out against the Covenant. At first it was going well, then setback after setback, loss after loss. They tore down bases we built over the course of weeks in mere hours, made what was supposed to be an ark to weather out this storm, into hell. Of course, that's all the ark is now. It's hell down there. Captain Cutter overlooks the Ark from the observation deck of the Spirit of Fire, alongside Anders. She had protested to be down on the ground, but when the fighting got bad, really bad, Cutter had forced Red Team to load her up into a pelican and send her on her way back to the Spirit. Cutter can oversee from up here 14 bases the Spirit of Fire had deployed or taken control of since their arrival on the Ark. They had arrived weeks ago. They came through the portal two days after the Master Chief left to Delta Halo. They had fortified their defenses as much as they could. When the Covenant arrived, they saw success at first. The Brutes weren't as smart as the Elites, and from all reports Cutter had gotten, there was no signs of Elites as part of his fleet. Six ships may not be a lot, but each one outgunned the Spirit of Fire. Cutter's decision to not face the Covenant directly meant he was biding his time for when he was truly needed. The Covenant had regrouped and begun taking base after base down on the Ark, setting them on fire and moving on to the next. The only stronghold left was Alpha Base, with Alice, Jerome, and Douglas defending it. The Brutes and their minions had not gained an inch of ground, but that could not last for much longer. They all knew it. Cutter knew it. The Spartans knew it. The Covenant knew it. The Spartans may be holding the line, but there were still casualties happening at an alarming rate down at Alpha Base. Cutter had just about begun to plan his exit route, a kamikaze attempt to take out as many Covenant ships with him as he was planning to pilot the Spirit of Fire into the Covenant battle group and everyone else running guerrilla ops down on the Ark. He had all but made his mind to have the crew evacuate in order to begin this plan, when he saw from the corner of his eye a single Covenant ship come through a portal. To call it a Covenant ship was a disservice. This ship was immense in size, putting even the capital ship the first Covenant strike force had brought into shame. But one thing did put a smile on Cutter's face. One single ship meant humanity had stopped any others from passing. That told him all he needed to know about the situation back on Earth. He also smiled at another thought. The ship, no matter how large and powerful it was, would be a prime target for Red Team. He knew once Alpha Base fell, and fall it will, Red Team would launch an assault on the supercarrier and take it down no matter the cost. What surprised him, however, was the supercarrier managing to find them, and quite easily. They had one line of transmission open between himself and Jerome, leader of Red Team, but the Covenant vessel was heading straight their way. That was until he heard a voice on the radio. Don't mind if we crash the party. Our invitation was lost. Cutter looks down on the screen displaying the roster for Blue Team. Blue 1, Sierra 117. Blue 2, Fred 104. Blue 3, Kurt 051. Blue 4, Linda 058. Blue 5, William 043. Blue 6, Kelly 087. Blue 7, Lee 008. Blue 8, Anton 044. This puts a grin on Cutter and Ander's face. They share all info they have gathered on the Ark and the Covenant forces. Red Team had been holding down Alpha Base, and Blue Team's help would be greatly appreciated. Just then, we can see eight projectiles being launched to the surface of the Ark. We can see them gathering heat and flames as they enter orbit. Anders asks, Are those? They sure are. Red Team, you have incoming reinforcements. Give the Covenant hell. Johnson stays on the line to explain the new elite human treaty. While the Shadow of Intent closes on the Spirit of Fire to rendezvous, on the ground, the Brutes lining up with chieftains just outside the kill box of Red Team all gather around Tartarus as he's preparing to launch a final assault against the base and be rid of the humans once and for all. This assault is halted when seemingly eight missiles land behind his forces. Tartarus laughs as the projectiles manage to only land on some grunts and not kill any of his Brutes. Until before the smoke clears out, three, four, six, eleven, brutes drop dead. Before he can continue to count, jackals, grunts, and brutes are dropping like flies without even having enough time to reach for their guns or shields. Tartarus experiences something he doesn't understand when he looks up to see what is happening. His hands go numb for a split second, so much so that he almost drops the fist of Rukt, a feeling he never thought he would have. He was the leader of the entire Jailhani race, but seeing eight demons running at him at an incredible speed left him waning in horror internally. He regains his composure and tightens his grip on the fist of Rukt, smashing it into the ground, sending shockwaves at the oncoming Spartans. The closest two leap into the air, one jumping right over him, shooting him with an SMG. Tartarus puts a hand up to block his face as the bullets bounce clear off his shield. The second Spartan to have jumped attempts to kick Tartarus midair, but he manages to grab the Spartan by the foot, almost smashing the demon into the ground. But in a blink, 
Tartarus had lost his grip and got struck on the face by another Spartan, one clearly much faster than the rest. Several more bullets begin to bounce off his shields, with five Spartans shooting at him, assault rifles, one SMG, and a battle rifle. These are all small arms fire for the brute. He believes he can withstand it just long enough to come up with a plan. The one wielding the Fist of Rooked could dispatch as many demons as would face him, or so he thinks. As he raises the Fist of Rooked, Gravity Hammer, a heavy caliber sniper shot cleaves right through his shields with a single shot, a swift shot. Three of his fingers and his thumb drop to the floor, alongside the legendary hammer. His eyes widen as he sees his fingers falling almost in slow motion. He tries to catch the hammer in midair, but the speedy demon is on his left side, pressing the human weapon known as a shotgun into the forearm of the brute. The next three things that go through his mind are almost instantaneous. A shot from Kelly into the white brute's arm separating the forearm from the bicep. A full SMG clip into the back of the brute coating his fur red. And a final sniper shot right between the eyes. The brute drops dead as all around left alive stand in disbelief. With grunts scattering to the wind and some jackals, though only a few gaining some bravery to attempt a comeback, and a few brutes trying to fight the Spartans and one another for leadership. The battle is ended and suppressed quick, fast and in a hurry. All 11 Spartans now regroup with Red Team getting to see the rest of the Spartans. Though there are more Spartans left back on Earth, the other colonies and other missions, this is the biggest gathering of Spartans since the beginning of Operation Red Flag. One thing stands odd to them though, the Covenant had stopped sending reinforcements even before the rest of the Spartans arrived, which means they had found their actual goal. Hellos are cut short as they see Shadow of Intent and Spirit of Fire move across the sky to try and engage the Covenant in a long range battle. Cutter comes over the radio to tell them the Prophets had gotten to the Citadel where the Ark and all rings could be activated, and they place a shield around the whole area. There is three places the shields need to be turned off at, and so Chief splits up the Spartans into Red Team, Jerome, Alice, Douglas, and himself, Blue Team, Fred, Linda, and Kelly, and Green Team, Kurt, Will, Lee, and Anton. Each team will strike one of the shield places and take it down so the Shadow of Intent and Spirit of Fire can close in and finish off the Covenant. The Arbiter will meet them on the ground to kill Truth and Mercy himself. The next mission here plays out the same as the Covenant from Halo 3. Except with Red Team's help, Chief is easily able to shut down the first section of the shield. With 11 Spartans working on the shield's shutdown, it goes down incredibly fast. However, just like in Halo 3, a slip space portal opens up above the Ark. Through it arrives High Charity, infected, with a small difference this time around. The population of High Charity was almost entirely converted from the sneak attack of the Flood since the Arbiter had called in a session of the Council, when it all went to hell. The crashing of High Charity into the Ark signals the end of the Covenant. Pods begin to rain down on every location possible, combat and pure forms able to attack all Spartan teams at will. Red Team pushes through the Citadel with the Ark's activation at hand. However, surprisingly to everyone, the Ark has not been activated. The Covenant had captured several humans from all other bases of the Spirit of Fire had established. What the humans and elites don't know is the assault of the Flood on the Citadel allowed it to infect those humans and the rest of the Covenant here. The Spartans and elites all arrive as the rings have begun to activate. The only reason they had activated to begin with was because a crew member of the Spirit of Fire had been abducted and was trying to run away from the infection form. She tripped over the convulsing body of the Prophet of Truth and accidentally activated the Ark on her fall down as an infection form began strangling her and digging itself into her spine for a connection with her nervous system. The Spartans and Elites here rush to deactivate the rings, but this leaves them all in a vulnerable position, surrounded and outnumbered by the Flood. Arbiter and his Elites, Chief and his 10 Spartans, all surrounded by tentacles and Flood forms creeping on them, seeking a way out. When a missile hits the window, exploding on impact and shattering an entrance into the Citadel, an albatross with an exposed open hatch comes in. From the back, Johnson is inside a Cyclops, yes, the Colossus. During the downtime while setting up bases on the Ark, the Spirit of Fire had mounted a minigun on one arm of the Colossus and a Spunkner rocket launcher on the other. Quite similar to the Mantis, however superior in some ways and inferior in others. With slow mobility and less overall firepower, but the minigun machine gun attached fires faster, making it more effective against small targets inadvertently making it very effective against the Flood. To this end, Johnson helps provide covering fire as the Arbiter takes his revenge on the only foe seemingly worth his time, the Prophet of Mercy, though only one remaining uninfected. Arbiter would have preferred to kill Truth, but he had already converted into Flood biomass. For this, he hates the Flood, more than for puppeteering his comrade's dead flesh 
After killing Mercy with his bare hands, he hops onto the albatross alongside all his elites, Jerome, Fred, Kelly, Kurt, Anton, and Lee. The ones that don't make it up into the albatross, however, are Chief, Douglas, William, Linda, and Alice. The five of them have no choice but to revert back to the way they came from. When they get back to the elevator though, they see a monitor fly by and down the chute, Chief and Arby drop on Halo 3. They follow it as they believe it is trying to escape as well. They're surprised to see it lead them to a console. While Alice, Linda, Douglas and Will hold off the flood chasing them, Chief confronts the monitor only to learn this is Guilty Spark. Reclaimer. On Halo, you tried to kill Cortana. You tried to kill me. Protocol dictated my response. She had the activation index and you were going to destroy my installation. You did destroy my installation. Now I have only one function, to help you, Reclaimer, as I always should have done. When did you know? Just now. But I had my hopes. What will you do? Light it. Then we are agreed. A tactical pulse will completely eradicate the local infestation. I will personally oversee the final preparations, though it will take time to fabricate. 343 three, Guilty Spark flies away. With that, Chief continues helping the Spartans fend off the Flood until they can get out of their new group with the rest of the Spartans and Elites. They find a downed Pelican just like Chief and the Arbiter and they take it to the ring where they regroup with all their forces. The assault on the control room of Installation 04B goes down almost the same, except with 11 Spartans this time divided into Red Team being those arriving on the Pelican and Blue Team being those that escaped the, with the Elites. Their fight for the control room is brutal as there's hundreds of ranged and tank forms lined up between them and the top of the tower. Blue Team's priority is to clear a path for Red Team and more specifically Master Chief with Cortana to reach and activate the ring. This is more important than ever as they see slip space portals open up all above them. Almost three dozen more infected flood ships show up heavily damaged but able to make it through. The Arbiter notes that this is good news for them, or at least the galaxy overall. If the Flood had beat them on Delta Halo, they would have arrived by the hundreds. So the Flood must have been defeated and traveled here as a last ditch effort to stop the rings and must have been on their way to the Ark already when the Prophets were killed. Now with all the Flood here, Chief leads a team through the bottom and Fred leads one through the top meeting at the entrance of the control room. They're ambushed through every door, thus leaving behind a few members every step of the way to watch their back. On the front door is Johnson with his minigun, as well as Linda and Fred with longer range weapons. On the second door, Kurt and Douglas, with Anton's help, stay behind to fight off the tank forms coming from the side door. On the semi-final door, Kelly, Lee, and Will head forward to stop the long range forms from having any clear shots of the Spartans. The end is essentially the same, except without Johnson taking the AI chip, Alice and Chief stay by the door guarding the entrance from flood forms crawling on the ceiling. 343 once again betrays humanity by blasting Jerome, leaving him an injury very similar to Atrox's denting of the armor and injuring Douglas's shoulder in Halo Wars 2. But he lives, meaning Johnson doesn't get needlessly blasted by Spark, and Spark is defeated when Jerome drops his classic Spartan laser for Chief to use against the monitor. Now with the ring active and ready for a tactical pulse, everyone is evacuating for their lives. With all the fighting outside, they won't make it to the Albatross. Blue Team had brought. The team on the outside door had begun to make their way back to the Albatross, as well as the one near the first door. With only the third team staying behind to hold the door for Chief, Jerome and Alice. Knowing with the injury slowing Jerome down, Chief orders Kelly to pick up Jerome and take him to the Albatross. Carrying another Spartan certainly slows her down a lot, but she's still outpacing all the other Spartans. Chief is not the slowest here by any means, but he is staying behind to keep watch over everyone as flood forms and sentinels rain down on them as a last ditch effort to stop or infect them. Johnson loads up on his Colossus and he gets on the cockpit to fly the Albatross. With Linda and Fred stopping any flood forms trying to board or hide or stow away, Kelly arrives carrying Jerome and soon after, Kurt, Douglas and Anton having been part of the closest team, it ends up being no surprise that Kelly passed them with her speed. With the last four being Chief, Alice, Lee and Will trying to hurry, but the ring is breaking up fast. The part holding up the Albatross begins to fall, so the remaining Spartans keep running towards a Warthog left behind. On board the Albatross, Johnson tells them their landing gear is shot and they won't be able to pick them up. So the Albatross will have to dock on the Shadow of Intent with his anti-gravity tech instead of the Spirit of Fire. But 
The Spirit of Fire is holding steady for them to get there with the Warthog. Since there isn't enough seats, Will and Alice rip off the turret from the Warthog and share a seat in the back while shooting out anything coming their way. This is Alice's preferred weapon, a machine gun turret. Much like George, she carries it around, but this time, sitting down on the back of the Warthog, just puts a smile on her face when remembering George. The end result being a halo run, but instead of the forward onto dawn here, it's the spirit of fire. When they finally make it on board, the shadow of intent has already crossed the portal back to earth and on the spirit of fire is following their steps. Just like the forward onto dawn, however, the spirit of fire is struck in the portal, but instead of being split in half, it is greatly damaged, almost running entirely out of power. The crew of the Spirit of Fire is extremely upset to learn they're stranded and without enough power to get back to the soul system. They will have to go into cryo hibernation once more. Anders decides she will stay up for a few days without drawing too much power and without depleting their food supplies. She wants to go through all the knowledge they gathered on the Ark alongside Cortana. After all, it's gonna be a very long time for an AI to have nothing to do as she remembers Serena. The other three Spartans on board go into cryo with Cutter and Chief being the last to be put on ice. I just hope it doesn't take another two decades to find us this time. Something tells me they'll find us when they need us. I hope you guys enjoyed this story. It was a bit of a long one, but I wanted to tell it differently than the others. I know some of you might not like how I told it, and some might not like how I compiled the original trilogy into a single video, but I didn't want to make any more episodical parts for a little while. I hope you hit the like button, helps with both the YouTube gods and truly makes my day to know what you guys liked or disliked. Leave a comment telling me if you like this style of storytelling or go back to the regular. Also, if you prefer episodic storytelling, if you're tired of me sucking up the Spartans and having them survive, and any other thoughts, Next video is gonna be the fall of Sidonius 5. Some of you who watched the second timeline for Linda already know a little bit of what happens on that planet. I commissioned some art. So far it looks great. It's not done yet. So once the artist is done, that video will be uploaded. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys think of these stories. I hope you have a great night and take care. Ciao.